So hello, my name is Paul Hudson, and this talk is called We're Better Than This. Um, if you haven't heard of me or my work before, I run this site called Hacking with Swift. Stacks of free Swift content there, or online, or free of charge, go check it out. I have this podcast called Swift of a Coffee, every two weeks with my friend Sean Allen. In fact, if you like those two things, come and grab me afterwards. I have stickers. And this year, for the first time, I'm uh, feeling weird enough to run my own conference, Hacking with Swift Live in Bath on July 8th and 9th. It's a charity event. So you can come along, you can make new friends, you can learn Swift, and contribute to App Camp for Girls. You do wonderful work. But this talk isn't about me, my site, my podcast, uh, my amazing event. Instead, it's not about me at all. We're gathered here today to, I hope, witness the era, the ending of the era of programming. It's time to say goodbye to it once and for all. And if that's going to happen, to really happen, we've all got to work at it. You see, it was programming that gave us the idea of move fast and basically screw over our users. That we should put our focus on profit before taking responsibility for our actions. It was programming that said, half ass is better than perfect. Rush through important work. Ignore safety standards. Ignore maintainability. Ignore accessibility. Just get it out there. And it was programming that told us we had earned our place as developers through our intelligence and our hard work. When in practice, nothing could be further from the truth. And the end result is we've managed to build one of the most toxic working environments of any industry in the world. So yes, I am super glad to see programming is in its death throes. It's done nothing but cause pain and suffering for people around the world. But if we're going to really finish it off, once and for all, it needs people like you, and you, and you, Rob, and me, and everyone here to work together, to understand the symptoms, to know what the problem is, and fix them so they never come back. And instead, I hope to build a new era where software developers can take responsibility for the things we make, where everyone's allowed and welcome to join our community regardless of their background. And we have a loud and powerful voice in user privacy. Now, in this talk, I'll be using some words that might scare you. Words like ethics, words like morals or diversity. And if you find these words hard to hear, I have some great news for you. There's at least one company who would love to have you join their team. More specifically, in this talk, I'll talk about four things. Quality, ethics, empathy, and inclusion. I've got stacks to get through. So let's go straight over to quality. Now, you all know, of course, Stack Overflow is the world's single largest collection of geeks. We gather there in one single place. And I've been there a lot. But I never really tried to join in the community. But I did know what folks said about it. There were blog posts like this one, Stack Overflow sucks. Or this one, why Stack Overflow sucks. Or this one, this is why Stack Overflow sucks. Or this one, why Stack Overflow sucks and participating there is impossible. But people have strong opinions about it. And it seems really clear they are negative opinions about it. But for some bizarre reason, I didn't really believe that. I wanted more information. I spent a week of my life answering Stack Overflow questions. Here I am here at the top of the leaderboard from a couple of years ago. I'd answered more questions than anyone else in that one week. I want to find out for myself. It took a lot of work to get that many points to that much. But what I found during that week made me fear greatly for our profession. What I found was there are three common problems people come across again and again and again, broad categories. One is, I don't know any better. That's questions like this one. How to restrict access to page with PHP, or this one. Echoing text if used not found in database, or this one. Fatal call to a member function, uh, MySQLI query. The code doesn't matter. What matters is these are all trivial problems, but they are all open to SQL injection. 
If you're not familiar with SQL injection, it looks like this. You say select star from users where ID equals dollar ID, some sort of variable being passed in. And when that's what you expect, like one, two, three, it makes sense. Find me user ID one, two, three, pull out their details and return them, please. But if it is ID equals one, two, three, semicolon, select password from admin, it becomes this. Two separate SQL queries, and the second one is the one that gets returned. You can see it right here. Username equals name two. Any string anyone's put in just goes straight into that string and executes SQL. It's been known about since 1998, back when Frack Magazine was still a thing. Ten years later, XKCD publishes a wonderful cartoon, Little Bobby Tables, with exactly the same problem. It was still a major known concern then. Almost 10 years later, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, still rates it as its number one attack vector for the web. But it's still made possible. The second problem, I just don't understand the problem I'm facing. Here's a question. Has anyone got a script or no, I can find one to validate Danish social security numbers in PHP? Thanks in advance. Well, <coughs> I am Paul Hudson, officially BSC, BA, MA, C, Eng, also world expert on Danish social security numbers, it turns out, aka can use Wikipedia. <laughs> so I go to Wikipedia, I read around, find the answer. It's a 10 digit number with the format DDMMYY SSSS. Brilliant. Boom, post the answer, hurrah, what a win. Comment comes back. Thanks, but it also needs to validate the checksum, etc. Okay, back to Wikipedia again to look at that. Turns out the checksum hasn't worked for a long time, so all I systems are presumed to update to accept numbers that fail the checksum. It isn't possible to do. But they haven't done the basic research to even find that out. Then there is, I just want the code, aka copy pasta. It looks like this. Detect the degrees in a circle with users touch. Great. A math geek, math's great. Here's your answer. You can get the delta between the x and the y, put it through eight and two, go from radians to degrees. Fantastic, you are done. That's some easy points. Eh, it didn't work. This is where Occam's razor comes in. Either the fundamental mathematical principles have gone wrong somewhere, or you put the code in the wrong place. 18 comments later between me and the poster, plus them dropboxing their code to me, I get one point. <laughs> <laughs> what we have acquired is Stack Overflow driven development. And it all affects us all to some extent or another, right? You go to Stack Overflow, you find the first solution that matches your problem, and you just paste it into your code. And if you do that, you're going to hit problems. We all are, because it means we have no idea really why our code is broken or why a solution fixes it. We just want to have the code pasted in there so we can sign off another task in JIRA. And even then, there's a good chance we'll put it in the wrong place. But it also means the concept of performance optimization is missing for many people. Devices these days, you know, your iPhone, XS, your Galaxy S10 and so forth, are so extraordinarily fast that performance optimization is largely a thing of the past. Here's a question I answered Stack Overflow. Uh, full of warnings here. Notice, warning, 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 notice. The question was, how do I extract this bit of JSON from the end of that string? Not how do I fix all the errors, how do I just get the JSON out of that? Now, you might be thinking, it's OK. I totally don't write that kind of code. No one on my team writes that kind of code. Well, let's have a look. Researchers asked 43 freelance developers to code registration for a web app, assessing how they did password storage. 26 devs initially chose to leave passwords as plain text. That's 60% of people, just the raw password in the database. They were then asked to go back and try again, not with plain text. Eight of those came back with base 64. <laughs> 16 used insecure hashing algorithms for which we have rainbow tables and have had for years. Gotta go fast, gotta break things. Then it's this. 
Internet of Things teddy bear leaked two million parent and kids message recordings. This kind of malpractice, and it is malpractice, causes real problems, causes real suffering. So maybe the problem's worse than you thought. Or this. Microsoft saying 70% of all security bugs are memory safety issues. To which the inimitable Matthew Garrett replied, no way to prevent this, say programmers have only language where this regularly happens. <laughs> there is a very strong case to be made that today it is no longer ethical to start programming in C. Or this, 1.25 million Dodge Ram pickups recalled over fatal software glitch. This is not, my app has crashed, it's fatal. People's lives are ending because of bad software. And even huge companies, like Apple, have mistakes all the time. Like this one, they had an autocorrect bug where I became A for everybody, and no one was quite sure why. Or this, my friend Jean-Pierre Simard was trying to file an expenses report, and he wasn't allowed to. The error came back. Your given name must match, not 039 exclamation mark, at hash dollar percent carrot ampersand. Da -da 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 -da. That was the error message to users because he had a hyphen in his name. So not only are they showing regexes to users, which make no sense, most of us, quite frankly, but his name was just invalid. Sorry, get a better name. <laughs> Last year, end of the year, Twitter had a new animation for doing Happy New Year. If you liked the tweet with uh, the New Year stuff, you got a special sort of fireworks animation. And I was curious how they did that. So I pressed view source, and that's what I saw. A wall of machine-generated gibberish. You ever wonder why Twitter maxes out your CPU now and then? That's why. It's bad. It's really bad. Now, <laughs> we've all written bad code. I'm not saying otherwise. We have deadline pressures, right? We have budget pressures. We have folks going off sick. We have clients changing their minds regularly, right? That's fine. That's one thing. But there's a very big difference between accidentally bad code and deliberately bad code. When we specifically ignore the safeguards given to us to do better. There's a saying, weeks of code can save hours of planning. And it's so true. People in our community genuinely believe they can charge ahead, and their extreme genius intellect backed up by Stack Overflow will get them through any problem. Compare that to engineers in other fields, like structural engineers. If they're asked to design a bridge to carry cars, they'll have a two to nine times safety factor. If it's been told it'll max out 100 cars, they'll make it carry 200 to 900 cars, even though the maximum's 100. Software developers, tests, lol. <laughs> I've seen so many Xcode projects where the only two tests were the ones provided by the Xcode project as examples of what tests should look like. Or mechanical engineers, almost Every switch, lever, or handle the pilot must touch during flight is shaped differently so they can handle these things in low-light emergencies. Us? I don't write comments because my code is self-documenting. We, we barely even write comments, and this is just isn't possible. Ben Sandowski, the creator of Halide, said this, the whole self-documented code thing goes out of the window as soon as performance is involved. All delicate workarounds for bugs and platform frameworks. All outlining API guarantees for people that don't have time to read the internals. Basically, all non-trivial problems. And yet, people still believe that non-trivial code can somehow be self-documented. Spoiler alert, it can't be. Or this. Here are just some of the safety standards a civil engineer has to adhere to when they build things. Us, we still have to convince other developers to care about folks with accessibility requirements. It's not charity, it's not generosity, it's not amenity, it's not gratuity. You don't bestow access to accessibility, you ensure it. 
whether that's text to speech support, handling color blindness, switch control, voiceover, it's a variety of things. We shouldn't have to fight for these things. I went to talk about two years ago now from Hang Chuang of Lyft uh, about accessibility, and someone asked him at the end, he said, okay, you've done all these things, it's fantastic. Do you have any analytics behind this to show how many folks are using it so I can use those numbers to convince my management to have accessibility in our, in our apps? And Hang's answer was perfect. He just totally nailed it. He said, it's not about making more money, although that might happen. It's about your company culture, what you actually value. Whenever he talks, people ask me afterwards, Paul, why do you read from your slides? It's so boring. Why do you do it? Fine, okay, maybe it's boring for you. But there are folks out there who are blind or have serious vision impairments, and that's what they can see. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for them. I, I care about people who are not like me. It's an amazing superpower I have, apparently. But there is one thing that programmers need no encouragement to do. Something we are gold medal Olympic champions at. Reinventing the wheel. And Eva said, Morpheus, do you the blue pill or the red pill? JS community, we didn't quite like either pill, so we made a green pill. And it's so true. It's like whack-a-mole trying to keep up with the endless ways we reinvent wheels. We're experts at it. We can't even agree on the broad stroke stuff. How we structure our codes, the MVC, MVVM, Elm, MLP, or Viper, the big stuff, we can't even agree on this stuff. Hell, that one's not even real, and half people didn't even notice that. <laughs> As Nick Lockwood said, the hardest problem in computer science is fighting the urge to solve a different, more interesting problem than the one at hand. Also known as shiny object syndrome. Our need to experience experiment with new stuff, the shiny new thing, rather knuckle down and solve the actual problems causing our users real suffering. So it's no surprise our ability to estimate work is effectively nil. We have planning poker, like random cards trying to figure out how long things take. Recently, Jesse Squires had a wholly new idea for doing estimations. He said this, choose a number of weeks I think it will take, Use that as temperature in Celsius, convert to Fahrenheit, that's your actual number of weeks. <laughs> and that's as good as anything else, quite frankly, as, as accurate as all the rest of the ideas we have. Even in talks like this one, we seek distraction. You want something funny or interesting behind me, so you ignore what I'm saying. When those slides go away, you're forced to listen to the uncomfortable truth. Careless software development is causing suffering to real people. And it wasn't always like this. Doug Linden wrote, a good programmer is someone who looks both ways before crossing a one-way street. And we can get there again. We can get there again because we're better than this. So that's quality. Let's talk about ethics. So I had this slide earlier, and this is, this is me. Uh, the CENG part, you often see. And CENG is short for a chartered engineer. Uh, it's a legally protected term here in the UK and Europe. Uh, and to become a chartered engineer, they have to go through a long process. They ask you a ton of questions. You've got to write a long essay. You've got to find a sponsor who, who writes an essay about you. You've got to have an interview and so forth. And as part of that process, never once do they ask you how many lines of code have you written? Never once they ask you, what's your favorite software architecture? Or, so, tabs and spaces then. <laughs> Never once. It doesn't happen. Instead, they ask questions like this one. How have you shown a commitment to personal standards, recognizing obligations to society, profession, and the environment? Or this one. How have you worked in a way that contributes to sustainable development? Or this one. How you support the development of others through activities such as mentoring. What would your answers be to those questions? How have you shown obligations to the environment? Remember this? A couple of years ago, an engineer had gone out of his way to cheat 
on pollution tests from cars, and in doing so, massively damage the environment. But we're software engineers, we haven't got to worry about the environment, surely. <coughs> Bitcoin today is a massive environmental problem. Bitcoin's annual consumption is greater than that of all these countries. And all these countries. And all these countries. Denmark, Greece, Israel, Switzerland, big countries use less power than just Bitcoin. There is no moderate middle ground here. If you are writing software that uses Bitcoin or accepts Bitcoin, you are actively working towards the collapse of our climate. And how about user privacy? Do you treat that ethically? We have companies like Google, just this year, we learned about ScreenWise Meter, which was give us all your networking data on your phone in exchange for Google Play gift cards. Also this year, whoops, our home security device had a microphone we forgot to tell you about. Last year, EU fined a $5 billion for the mandatory bundling of the entire Google suite of apps on Android. Also last year, GDPR complaints from seven different EU countries because Google were tracking your location even after you'd asked not to be tracked. And the year before, in the UK, they went into a voluntary code of practice, which, which sounds great. Oh, Google are volunteering. Yes, they're volunteering not to link people to copyright infringing websites. Very nice of them, Google. Well done. And I could talk to you about the many and varied ways uh, Uber has found to violate privacy, or how Twitter allows harassment and abuse to continue, or how Amazon Alexa stores its things forever, all the recordings you ever make to it are stored forever and ever. But they're all basically a rounding error compared to Facebook. We learned this year they were lobbying against GDPR, GDPR, GDPR across all of Europe. We learned they were sending and receiving health data like blood pressure and ovulation status without user consent to be stored by Facebook. We learned they're sending the user location across the board, even if the user asked not that to happen. They let private messages, things you were turned off anyone else but you and somebody else, be seen by 150 third parties without our consent. Seven million users had their unpublished photos sent to app developers to work with. And of course, we also learned last year that Cambridge Analytica had half of its 87 million users' data without consent. At this point, Facebook is so toxic, it's better to have said you were in jail than you worked there. Now, if you aren't seeing the problem, you aren't, quite frankly, paying attention. As they're saying, you are some of the five people you hang out with most. So if we look up to these companies and aspire to be like them, we're missing the point. We're getting it wrong. And if you work there and can, please quit. As Tim O'Reilly said, Work on stuff that matters. Work on things with an actual positive impact on the world. Because we are better than this. Let's talk about empathy. Human beings are extraordinarily skilled at creating division. We're really good at it. We love to differentiate ourselves from somebody else, to create an us and a them. When really, there is no them. Just a whole lot of us. And we are not in any way immune to that in the tech industry. We're just as bad. Here's a pop quiz for you. Here are some quotes by a famous software developer doing public code review. See if you can, in your heads, figure out who said these words. Your whole email was so horribly wrong, and the patch that broke things was so obviously crap, the whole patch is incredibly broken shit. The old code was correct, your code is shit, and you didn't fix anything. Fuck me, what's wrong with you people? This piece of shit commit is marked for stable, but you clearly never even test commanded, did you? The above code is shit, and it generates shit. It looks bad, and there's no reason for it. I really see no reason for this kind of complete idiotic crap. And right now, it's a fucking disgrace you're in denial about the fact that it's checking it's broken, not the code, and I'm making excuses for shit. Who thought? That was a suitable thing to write in public code review. Linus Torvalds, creator of Linux. And people look up to him as some sort of geek hero. 
This guy's a genius. He's amazing. I saw a sign last year, I think, January this year, perhaps, and it's really stuck with me. It's this one. You're never too important to be nice to people. Or, phrased more carefully on Twitter, being an asshole doesn't make you Linus. But in our community, we have this chronic need to publicly shame people when they make mistakes. And we say, oh, you know, our code review was bad, but don't worry, it's just banter. It's not banter, it's snark. You're tearing people down. And the rest of the world finds this utterly baffling that we behave this way. It's an actual story. Programmers are having a huge debate over whether they should be required to behave respectfully to each other. In this case, a, a chap, I think it was the LLVM, I believe it was, left because he was opposed to having a community code of conduct that insists all people are welcome and are treated with respect. No, I'm opposed to that. I'm going to leave based on that. It's so easy to forget the golden rule of code review. Code review is where mistakes are rubbed out, not rubbed in. We're all in this together. We're all on the same team. We're all trying to ship great software. And if you want to do better at code review, I have four tips for you. First, remember, we're all learning. Great quote by Patrick McKenzie, every great developer you know got there by solving problems they were unqualified to solve until he actually did it. We're all solving things for the first time at some point. But easy to forget what that point was, because that was three years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. I'm much better than that now. It doesn't matter, you can still be humble about it. This kind of thing worries me. Coming from a legal profession where citing sources are required, it's weird to see so little citation of sources in tech talks and blogs. This lack of citations adds to the false impression that people in tech just know all the things they talk and write about. We forget how we got to where we are. And that's massively discouraging for newcomers. I'm not sure about the Android world, I can tell you in the iOS world, this is really endemic. There are some major blogs who will only ever link to themselves. So think about the way you structure your team. Probably something like this. Developer, senior developer, lead developer, and architect, something like that. You may have uh, recruiters, of course, try and tell you there's a, there's a fifth tier underneath. Um, of course, that isn't actually true. It's usually only four tiers. But how do you make sure those people get trained? Is it the architect's job to waterfall train everybody down from on high? You've got a trickle-down approach where the architect trains a lead, lean trains a senior, senior trains a regular developer. Do you sort of direct all your training at the most junior member of staff to help get them up there? Or do you recognize that everyone has something to learn and everyone has something to teach? That simple rule ought to underpin the training strategy of any good software team. Second, use your power wisely. This quote here, if you're a person in a position of power over other people, and yes, being famous constitutes power, and you are not actively examining and questioning your use of that power every day, you are abusing it, and you may be causing massive harm. And you might say, well, what power do I have? Well, think about how you do code reviews. Why do we nitpick in code reviews? What are you trying to do? To prove how clever you are, to, to feel useful. Very often, we're much more thorough at reviewing someone else's code than we would be of our own code. And so Frank Kruger said this, my GitHub PR management style is slowly changing. Old is code reviewing until it's exactly how I would have done it. New is just merge the PR. Fix it and post it needed, get over yourself. So does your code review process get you the results you want? If not, why are you still doing it? And it applies also to interviews. Here's me from a few months ago. At some point, our industry will come to terms with the fundamental truth. A coding test doesn't measure how good you are at coding, only how good you are at coding tests. And those are not the same thing. If you do this hideous whiteboarding, invert binary tree nonsense during your coding tests, if it gets to the same monogamous problem you have right now, the same people you were when you joined the company, it's not getting you want to be. It's not a diverse setup. Get rid of it. Move on. 
And third, skip the blame. There's a great law, uh, somewhat facetiously called Nixon's law, which is the person who can smile when things go wrong has thought of someone they can blame it on. Uh, and there's a very, very famous Reddit thread which has a lesson for us all, I think, quite frankly. This one here, uh, it's quite long, don't worry about the words. Uh, this young person joined a company, was handed some onboarding docs to follow along, try things out, and he went through them all. And it turns out the company had used production credentials in their onboarding docs, so he wiped the production database on day one. They claimed they had no backups. He was told to leave immediately, he was fired, and that legal would be in touch. That sort of thing shouldn't even be possible. Because hopefully you know what we call developers make mistakes. Developers. We all make mistakes. We have this chronic need to shame people. Because by making them feel smaller, we feel bigger. And fourth, look for opportunities to actually get alongside people and help them out. Code review is not just nitpicking. And even if you've been doing it for a few months, you can still help people. There are still folks who know you less than you. And even if you work from home by yourself, you can still find ways to help people. Don't use that as an excuse. Here's me saying I'm making myself available as a mentor for a handful of folks who need it. There's no charge. I'm just agreeing to help you via Skype or email for support and similar for a full year. Or here, in March, if you are underrepresented in tech and work with Iris and Swift, I'll have a Skype call with you about anything at all. Career advice, co-tips, something else, anything, I'll do it. Or here. If you're underrepresented or you're a first time speaker, I'll happily help you with your slides to submit to a talk, a presentation. I want to see more diverse speakers on stages like this one. Scott Hanselman from the C Sharp community said this Now that I have some success, I'm going to be the luck for as many people as I can be. That means retweets, warm intros, job referrals, hey, you should talk to, etc. Who can you be the luck for? Please remember, we're here to solve problems for real people, not just argue amongst ourselves about tabs and spaces and MVVMC. It's time to ditch the snark, because we are genuinely better than this. Now, let's talk about inclusion. Time for some audience participation. Think of a genius. Anyone? Five, four, three, two, one. You probably thought of this guy. Albert Einstein, almost certainly. And that's not a coincidence. The sad state of our industry is most geek conferences like this one are overwhelmingly male. And it's common, and not surprising, for men to look for male role models. Simone de Beauvoir said, humanity is male, and man defines woman not in herself, but relative to him. What that means is our society assumes maleness by default. When I say genius, many folks hear male genius. This is really common. Here is the Wikipedia entry for the England national football team. This is about the men's team. It's about the women's team, it's the England women's national football team. Same true for the Dutch team and many other teams. Exception is the Americans. I hope not just because their ladies are much better than the men, it turns out. <laughs> A famous example, of course, is the Spanish language. Many female teachers are called las profesoras. One man in the mix becomes los profesoras, profesores. A male uh, noun is immediately, male pronoun, immediately. In Dutch, you can say advocaat or advocata, male and female lawyer. You ask Google, hey Google, what's a lawyer? It'll say advocat. It assumes you mean male. Zanger or zangeres, male and female singer. Give me a singer, please. It's a zanger. It's always male. My wife's Hungarian. Hungarian has no he, she, and it. It has one word, er. It means he, she, and it. There's no distinction between sexes over there. Just er. You say Google, What's er ordvash in English? He's a doctor. What is er edge nerver? She's a nurse. Now, I'm not trying to say that computers are somehow hardwired to be biased against women. What I am saying is that garbage in, garbage out. 
when we put all our assumptions into them, it's no surprise they mimic our biases. We've taken our assumption of male as default and given it to machines. And it goes far beyond just language. We've taken the whole male experience to be everyone's experience and try to apply that across the board. You know, if you want to work for us at J Random, awesome Acme company, we have to see lots of activity on GitHub. We want to see open source contributions. You want to write a blog. Okay. Women do twice the household work and four times the childcare of men. They have three to six hours per day of unpaid work versus 30 minutes, two hours of men. They have almost an hour a day less spare to rest than men. They're two and a half times more likely to be antidepressants. They're three times more likely to have sub migraines. And 90% of single parents are female. But yeah, by all means, get on GitHub and get working in open source. Okay, forget GitHub then. Speak at events. Go to local meetups. Raise your profile that way. In a survey, 62% of women said they were afraid of being in multi-story car parks by themselves. 60% said they were afraid of being in train platforms by themselves. 49% waiting at bus stops by themselves. And 59% walking home by themselves. For men, it's less than half that across the board. Okay, forget me, Tubbs. Forget me, Tubbs. What great companies you worked at? What's your employment history? Research this too. Women were asked around the world, how many of you have experienced some form of sexual harassment since you were 15 years old? Netherlands, 73%. America, 81%. The UK, 68%. And when men were asked to estimate those numbers, hey men, how many women do you think have been harassed since they're 15? Men said 38%, 44%, and 46%. We dramatically underestimate how bad things are. And so we have things like this. Amit Singhal grabbed an employee's breast at an offsite. Google paid him $45 million severance. Andy Rubin coerced oral sex with an employee. Google paid him $90 million severance. I was harassed by my engineering director and my SVP. I had to quit with zero severance. The place where the harassers are treated better than the harassed. But we have pinball tables, we have ping pong, we have blow up chairs, we have slides. Here's Junior Coutine saying from a recruitment email, my clients are colle uh, cutting edge organization with a collegiate vibe. As a nearly 30 year old mother, I'm more scared by a collegiate vibe than enticed. And so it's no surprise that two-thirds of senior Silicon Valley women say they felt excluded from social networking events because of their gender. Uh, Apple, a couple of years ago, had a new campus built, Apple Park, the, the spaceship, the UFO thing that Steve Jobs personally designed or whatever, right? Um, Slate wrote a story. He said this, there's a 100,000 square foot fitness and wellness center. A two-story yoga room covered in stone has been carefully distressed to make it look like the stone at Steve Jobs' favorite hotel in Yosemite, plus medical and dental services. Title of the article, Why Doesn't Apple's State-of-the-Art New Campus Include a Daycare for Kids? If you're older like me, you might read this book here, Hackers, Hero of the Computer Revolution by Stephen Levy. He says in there, you would hack and you live by the hacker ethic, and you knew that horribly inefficient and wasteful things like women burn too many cycles, occupy too much memory space. The sad fact was there never was a star quality female hacker. And the next four words, I promise you, I had the book at home. No one knows why. As if somehow he missed, he just wrote those exact words about women. And companies somehow wonder why do we only have, or mostly have, male developers. What they're missing out on is that representation matters. If you look back at the pitch that I've shown you so far, zero have been a women. I've deliberately erased all pitches of women from this talk. But most of you probably didn't even notice. But it matters. Harvard did a science study on this. They asked female students, girls, here's a science textbook. It was filled with pictures of men and science. Here's an exam, how well do you do? They scored an average 7.4 to out of 12. Same textbook, female pictures of scientists, 9.3 out of 12. 
Otherwise, the same text. Seeing people like you matters. The Fortune 500, the 500 biggest companies in the US, only 24 have female CEOs, i.e. less than 5%. At E3, the last year, the most recent one, only 8% of games being shown off had female protagonists. You think, wow, 8%, that's really bad. Two years before, it was 3% of games had female protagonists. That's one in 33. You could play 32 games and not see a single female lead character. As a reminder, if you don't remember, in the US, it's a 50-50 split of male and females playing games. And so we've seen a massive collapse in participation in our community. In 85, 37% of people uh, who got computer science degrees were female. 2012, it's 18%. In 91, they had 37% of all computing jobs. In 2014, it's 26%. Today, 41% say they leave tech after just 10 years. They've had enough. Those are 17% of men. And so the few women we do have end up representing the millions of other women who've been hounded out. Here's Scooter Phoenix saying, always the only black woman at a DevOps meetup, but I embrace it. I'm here representing for people who look like me. My presence lets everyone know we're out here. Or here's Julia saying, real talk, I don't often dress very femme, but if I'm surrounded by seas of men, I dress super femme to represent all women who should be here but aren't. Or here's Moonchild, I love breaking the stereotype as to how a person in tech should look like. I love attending conferences with a low-cut top, dominatrix heels, and a slicked hair to the gods. Oh, and then deliver a talk on machine learning while I'll show you off my autonomous car built in C in Java. And how awesome is that? In the IOS, we have UIConf, one of the oldest and best known conferences in Berlin. And this year, something new, they have an all female speaker lineup. So I'd never seen before in the IOS community. And predictably, many men had a response. They were really unhappy. Men who had, for years, no problems with all male lineups were very, very shouty and angry on Twitter about an all-female lineup. Engin, who helps organize UICOMP, said this, I've never seen so many men raise their voices and stand up a 50-50 speaker lineup before. That's what it took. No, they scream, quotas don't work. It's discrimination. It's not right. It's not fair. Science. Actual headline from the Independent. Workplace gender quotas weed out incompetent men and make business more efficient. Because the people who have the most to fear from quotas are the mediocre men who are there, not because of their knowledge or their work, because of their background. We have this bizarre belief that if we add more women and we add more girls to our community, we'll end up with fewer and fewer and fewer men, and it'd be awful. Gosh, what would we do? Instead, this is what's going to happen. Our community will just get bigger and stronger and more diverse. And that's just the beginning. Because black or white, male or female, young or old, straight or gay, the people building digital tools for the whole world need to be reflective of the people using those tools. Because when we're designing a world that's meant to work for everyone, we need everyone in the room. Because we are better than this. So that's the last part of my talk, and I'll wrap up this briefly. Uh, I've tried super hard, as you might tell, to provide as many citations, quotes, sources, and facts as I can cram into one short talk. And there are four ways you can respond to all those numbers. First, you can say, I don't believe those facts, as if facts are somehow negotiable. <laughs> you might say, I believe those facts, but I don't care. In which case, I'm here to tell you your days are numbered. Programming is dying out. You might say, I believe those facts and I care, but I don't want to do anything about it. In which case, you're kind of like the silica gel in your Amazon packet. You're there, but no one's really sure why. <laughs> or you might say, I believe those facts and I care and I want to make a difference. And if that's you, I hope you can leave here today with a fresh vision for change. 
Here is Kelsey Hightower saying, the thing we're trying to build should be more exciting than the tools used to build it. I want you to walk away remembering that the code we write is the means, not the end. There's more to us than just architectures and tab versus spaces. We're here to solve real world problems. I want you to walk away thinking what your own answer to these questions might be. The CNG questions, these are only some of them. How would you answer those if you were asked them today? What would you say? And if you want to learn more about ethics, it's fantastic. There's a great talk by Jonathan Rothwell and Steve Freeman. It's called So You Can Sleep at Night. It shows the full scope of the problem we're facing. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. For code reviews, I recommend you follow April Wenzel on Twitter from Compassionate Code. She's absolutely amazing. She has these uh, Compassionate Code tech values, not ego, but humility, not elitism, but inclusion, not competition, but cooperation, not being smart, but learning, not being a rock star, but being a mentor. These are her guidelines for modern tech. We all need to be striving for these things. Eric Zidun, a prompt member of the iOS community, said this, allow yourself to be professionally stupid. Ask questions, learn new things, be wrong and grow from that. People who build walls around knowing cannot grow and develop skills, be more impressed by humble than overconfident. And if you can't do that, why not? What's holding you back? And finally, I want you to walk away remembering that we all need to work towards building a more diverse and more inclusive community. So here are five small things you can do. First, you can add a code of conduct to repositories. Then stick to it. It's pretty easy. Say what you're going to do, then do what you said you're going to do. That's it. Share your salary information. It doesn't have to be like, tied to your name or company. Do it anonymously. I've been doing this many years of work at these kind of companies. Here's what I earn. Put it online somewhere. Folks will benefit. Stop calling everyone guys. This is a wonderful tweet from Leslie Carr. I hate when men claim guys are gender neutral, then get upset when I ask them how the guys they're dating. Fourth, stop telling female engineers to change jobs. As Amy Nguyen said, every time you tell a woman in software engineering she should change to a PM role because you're so organized, an angel loses her promotion. An organized female programmer isn't a wannabe project manager. Just makes her an organized programmer. And finally, don't support events that ignore inclusion. Here's me from a month ago. Another conference invite declined due to a lack of diversity in the speaker lineup. It was like tiny action, but it's something. We need to do better. Those are five small things. If you want to know big things, awesome. Ask woman. I recommend very strongly these two books, Invisible Woman by Carolyn Carrado Perez and Mary Beard's Women of Power. Just try to read about how the role of women has been controlled and erased for literally thousands of years and still is today. As Annette Moser Wellman said, don't be a person who responds to change, be the person who creates it. Now, I don't claim these changes will be easy, but I know as a community, we can do it. I know that because I'm better than this. I know you are better than this. I know we're all better than this. Thank you very much.